so thank you uh, dr rohit for inviting for the talk in such a uh, uh, good talk um, i'll take this forward and we'll discuss the strategies for managing an infected total hip replacement now infection in any arthroplasty is a devastating complication and it is quite frustrating for surgeon as well as patients now it's a unique challenge not only because it's a big problem but also we have compounded this problem by creating multiple definition talking about different tests and of course there are multiple management protocols with a lot of eminence based uh, medicine there there is of course a lot of evidence also and we'll talk about what the evidence says so there is little or no consensus on many things but there is definitely a consensus on the fact that the prevention is better than actually treating them so we all know that it begins in the pre operative period there is a lot of thing that we need to do during the operative time and also what we need to do in the post operative period we know there are patient factors we know there are wound related issues just one second i'll just minimize the screen and i'm going to okay yeah so so there are ways in which we can prevent infection and i think that's perhaps the most important part of this talk because if you prevent the infection we need not have the second part of the talk so in each of these aspect that i have put this um, slide on there is room for improvement now so this talk we'll we'll uh, talk about whether it's an infection how do you determine that it is infection once we know that it's an infection we define what type of infection it is and then we choose what is the most appropriate strategy for eradicating this infection the last but not least will be the strategy for reconstruction and most of it would be dealt by uh, the other two speakers who are experts in this field we diagnose the infection on clinical suspicion serology culture results histology and there are some basic molecular technique that is adopted to diagnose these infections so if you look at this pyramid the first step on this pyramid is that we suspect an infection if patient comes in with pain um with discomfort in a previously well functioning hip then that should raise the suspicion of infection then we go on to some very basic investigation like esr and crp apart from other investigation then you do the aspiration and finally if you are still confused there can be some help from the other radiological thing especially the pet scan now this is something which is uh, which has given an objectivity to otherwise subjective uh, diagnosis of infection and this is the guideline that is given by the parvizis group and it says that if there is um the, the proposed criteria is that if there is a sinus tract communicating with the processes a pathogen is isolated by culture from two or more separate tissues or fluid samples obtained from the affected prosthetic joint or four of the following six criteria which includes an elevated esr elevated crp elevated wbcs which is the synovial wbc elevated pmns in the synovial fluid an obvious presence of prolence an isolation of microorganism in one culture of the periprosthetic tissue or fluid or greater than 5 neutrophils per hyper field in 5 hyper field is uh, in and that hyper field reflects the 400 times magnification it also acknowledges that certain low grade infections these criteria may not be routinely met for diagnosis of the infection now let's talk about esr and crp because they they are the commonest thing that we um, we look at and esr more than 30 and a crp more than 10 has almost 96% sensitivity and 59% specificity to diagnose an infection similarly a synovial crp which is coming in vogue these days of more than 3.6 mega mg per deciliter has a higher specificity than esr and crp combined in a blood leukocyte esterase is another test that is being increasingly used it's an enzyme specific to wbcs and neutrophils it's got more sensitivity and specificity than um, esr and crp alone it's a relatively inexpensive test and it almost provides an instantaneous result the only thing is that the sample that is collected should not be contaminated with the blood now because many of these are not completely sensitive and specific we have moved a step ahead and we have used some more biomarkers which are more sensitive and specific and these include human alpha defensive ela2 bpis 
NGL and lactoferrin. So these five peptides have shown to be more specific and more sensitive, although they are expensive and not universally available. Culture, it's, it's one of the uh, um, key things that we need to have because not only it will determine the strategy, but it also aids in the chemical eradication. So we need to take three to five sample. Why three and why, uh, why not more than five? is because that if you it, it is to distinguish between a commensal or a contamination with an actual infection so if you've got two samples growing the same organism the possibility of it showing a, uh, it not being a contamination is very high so anything that has two organism being grown in the same same organism being grown which should be taken as a infection if you take however more than five some people do take up to six but if you take more, then the chances of this differentiation is less. So, for example, if you get two or three contaminant sample, then it is difficult to judge whether it was a contamination or actual infection. So the recommended is three to five. The use of Bellotini beads increase um, the pickup of these low-grade organisms. And what these beads do is when you shake it, they dislodge the bacteria and enhance the chance of positive culture. Few centers who have got the facility can place these processes in large sterile containers of saline and use sonications to increase the possibility of getting the organism. And why so much stress on this is because if you get an organism and its sensitivity, your half the battle is won. So it's very important to use everything at your disposal to get the organism and the sensitivity pattern. As an orthopedic surgeon, we are only we are most often focus on reconstruction and leaving it, uh, leaving other things to the other members of team, which is good. But I think one aspect of this thing, one very important in this uh, war is the ability to get the organism and the sensitivity and the stress placed place on this cannot be enough. Now the management depends on few things. It depends on the timing of the diagnosis. Primarily, so we, the, the Sukayama and at all have described it into type one to type four. So type one is the one in which you have taken a patient for revision and you find a positive intraoperative cultures, which is two or more cultures, and you treat them in appropriate antibiotics. Type two is early postoperative infection. It occurs within the first month after surgery. This again is a bit controversial because some people say for the hip it should be up to three months. So while for knee it's considered one month. For hips, some people will take it up to three months. And the treatment would be attempt at debridement with processes salvage. Acute hematogenous infection occurs in a by secondary to the hematogenous seeding of the previously well-functioning arthroplasty. And um, there can be, I mean, this is again a, a, a gray area, whether attempt at debridement with processes salvage or one-stage revision may be considered. And late or chronic infection is which occurs over time. Now the key decision making in this whole thing is we have to, as a surgeon, we need to decide whether the infection is superficial or deep. What's the duration of symptom in relation to the index arthroplasty? How is the host? That's critical. How are the soft tissues? How are the implant, whether they are loose or well fixed? And what the offending microorganism is? Based on these seven things, you can have their, your own algorithm on what you want to do. The key goal is to eradicate infection, prevent recurrence, restore function, and contain cost. And no matter where you are, Australia, US, or India, I think one of the things in these infection is the humongous cost of revising these and treating these infection. No matter what your strategy is, these four things remain the same. One is the chemical eradication. The second is the physical eradication, the reconstruction, and optimization. Whichever strategy you use, whichever patient you have, if you use these four things and keep these four um, uh, markers in your mind, you will be able to deal with these infections. So, as I said, there are multiple strategies. It could be ir irrigation and debridement with the retention of the existing processes. A one-stage processes exchange, a two-stage with an antibiotic spacer in, in between, or it could be a salvage like an arthrodesis or excision arthroplasty. 
again by Parvizi et al. This is a simple algorithm uh, that's been given. If you look to the right side of thing, you'll see that whatever. So if you have a sinus tract, if your post-operative time is more than four weeks, or if you have MRSA, so that constitutes the right side of your screen. And all of these three things, any of these three things is an indication for a two-stage revision. So for a moment, if you look at only this part of your screen, you'll see that these all, the, all these three things, sinus tract, post-operative time more than four weeks in MRSA, they are inclined to consider a two-stage revision. And again, uh, there is a two division into this, is whether you should have only one spacer exchange or a spacer exchange again after six weeks will depend on how the person has responded to the antibiotics and that local spacer. So if you are in doubt, you should not rush to do the second stage, but it can be called as a third stage wherein you have had two exchange. Coming to the left side now, so if you had um, a, a non-MRSA, less than four weeks and no sinus tract infection, then you have to decide whether it is a cemented hip or an uncemented hip. If you have a cemented hip, if you have a loose implant, then again, you go for a two-stage revision. But if it is not a loose implant, then you can do a retention of component with an irrigation and debridement. On the other hand, if there is an uncemented hip and the duration is less than two weeks, then you can think about one stage revision. But if it is more than two weeks, the same algorithm as a cemented one happens. So the only difference is that the cemented hips and uncemented hip of more than two weeks duration are clubbed together. Whereas an uncemented hip less than two weeks duration is clubbed uh, in a separate way. So this is a small algorithm which can be used to kind of uh, clarify your own thought before taking up such patients. The single stage revision in short should be reserved for acute onset immune competent host, a well fixed component. One of the important part is that you should have an identified organism with known sensitivities. And of course you should have an adequate soft tissue and bone stock to reconstruct. There are papers from all across the globe and endoclinic is, um, and Professor Gurk is one of the leading authors for one stage revision, but you'll find that time and again, there are large series which have showed an equal result with one stage and two, revi two stage revision. But the key here is to choosing your patient and your cases appropriately. As I said, no matter what you choose, one stage or two stage or a triple stage, there are key elements. And one of the key elements is the physical elimination of infection. Now, how do you do it? You work like a tumor surgeon. And oftentimes I actually call my tumor surgeon to help me because unlike us who are a bit conservative in terms of preserving bone stock in not resecting tissues, these people are more brutal if that's the right word. And they would go all around and debride it very thoroughly. So that's the key point. You, you have anything in doubt, you don't have to leave any doubtful tissue. Every piece of cement has to come out if you're doing a cemented thing. Every piece of doubtful tissues, dead necrotic tissue has to come out. It has to be brutal. Although we are not, as an arthroplasty surgeon, we are not that brutal. But we, this is one case where you need to be very, very uh, generous in resection. The sequence usually is an implant removal, cleaning the acetabulum, removing all the capsules and ovian labrum. Then you turn your attention to the canal. Don't forget to remain every piece of cement and don't be afraid to remove what you think is infected. The second and equally important or perhaps more important part is the chemical elimination. So physical and the chemical. Now, how do you do chemical? So again, there are a few strategies. One is the systemic things. The systematic, systemic antibiotics, copious irrigation and topical antiseptics. Then there are two parts of the local antibiotic delivery. So you are giving antibiotics and so there are disinfectant and there are antibiotics. So disinfection is what you do locally with irrigation. If you believe in better than washes, that's the local disinfection. Whereas the antibiotic is systemic and local and the local can be divided into two, which is one is your antibiotic spacers. And the second is the local drug delivery system, which I'll talk about. As I said, your local, your systemic antibiotics depends on the infection and it is good to have an antibiogram from your institute in case you do not get a culture uh, from the uh, from the specimens. So these two things are for the systemic antibiotics. 
these are the spaces which are the local antibiotic delivery system and not only they are the antibiotic delivery system they also help maintain the joint space and give some function to the limb and it makes your subsequent surgery easier i think one of the game changers has been the local delivery system and stimulan or any other um, um, antibiotic delivery to the wound because these ensure that the mic concentrations locally are very high and that's the key because systemic antibiotics often have a systemic side effects as well so these systems have probably tilted um the 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 balance in favor of one stage revision for low grade infections and even the need for multiple revision of antibiotic spaces have reduced because of availability of this so in my opinion this has been one of the game changers in our war against infection as i said reconstruction is going to be dealt with rami and uh, james shortly just suffice to say that it has got two ends it's got bony and soft tissue and both have equal importance when you are reconstructing don't forget about abductors don't forget about stability so the reconstruction is an important part of this war i'll run through an illustrative case so this is a 32 year old man, male who had come to us with a discharging sinus over left hip region since past 3 months it was continuous non foul smelling and not associated with fever he was a type 1 diabetic on medication in two, year 2008 he had sustained a uh, road traffic accident in which he had a neck femur fracture for which cc screw fixation was done 6 months later he had a discharging sinus and implant was removed it's been unfortunate that 6 months later when the thr was done again he uh, developed an infection and he was apparently all right for a period of around 10 years and presented to us with a discharging sinus for 3 months duration in september when he presented to us he had a uh, he had grown staph aureus so we removed the stem and we put this spacer in and you can see we have also put a lot of stimulan bead the calcium phosphate and antibiotic delivery system and um, because it was an uncemented system we had to do an osteotomy it was not a loose implant and we removed this this is the culture it was sensitive to monocef and clinda so we gave a dual antibiotic we got the uh, diabetes under control and in february after 3 months of the surgery his count was normal the esr and crp had returned to normal and in that stage we did a ct scan to assess the bone um, uh, tissue and to devise a strategy for reconstruction and finally this is the reconstruction and we also use a lot of back dressings and mini back dressings so you can see that thing there is a is a mini back dressing that we use in these patient so use of certain technology good reconstruction helps so in conclusion the evidence for best practices is still evolving there is a complex relationship between organism host and the implant the key principle in whatever strategy you use is a good physical and chemical eradication and of course as an arthroplasty surgeon we should provide a good stable reconstruction the waterloo in this war is the pathogen virulence factor which is beyond our control the bacterial biofilm sometimes they receive irregular antibiotic therapy from their general practitioners before we take cultures we must avoid sampling errors and inappropriate culture methods so so some things can be changed some things can't and before i end my talk i would end with this recent article in which parvizi who done a lot of thing on periprostatic infection asked has have we improved and an emphatic answer was no we have still not and this is from the institute which has done so much work and it says that we still need to do much more to be able to win this war i thank you gentlemen for your attention mm -hmm.